And um, up next is Jack Mankies. And um, he's going to give us a very interesting and informative lecture with some nice pictures um, about skin decompression sickness. Thank you very much, Jack. Thank you, everyone. So um, I'm going to uh, speak about skin decompression sickness. And um, I, I must say, I've seen a number of beautiful cases, but uh, I've never seen a case as beautiful as this one that is uh, published uh, in the uh, International Journal of Emergency Medicine in 2016. So uh, just a wonderful example of, uh, of cutis marmorata. And um, if we want to describe this, uh, the lesions that we typically see in terms of morphology, this is, as you, as you saw in the picture, it's a macular rash, uh, typically described as marbling of the skin, and it looks like marble, obviously. Uh, you don't see any raised edges, and you don't have any papules, vesicles, or postules, etc., associated with this skin rash. The color, normally you have more than one color present, so bluish purple, uh, red purple, pink purple, uh, even white areas, etc. So, so that is typical of the rash. It's not uh, like a uniform, the whole rash is just pink or just blue or something. It, 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 normally you would see more than one color if you have a close look. And the distribution is, is typically around the trunk, um, abdomen, chest, lower back and breasts, the buttocks and upper thighs, the triceps area, but it does not affect the face, the neck, the hand, the head, the, the feet, and so forth. Oftentimes, when you, uh, when you talk to these patients, they also say that it is quite painful. Um, sometimes they describe it as, as ants or like worms moving under the skin. Uh, there's pruritus often associated with this as well. Um, and, and this would be the typical description of cutis marmorata. The question is, you know, why do I... Uh, talk to this issue. I mean, is this something that, that we see fairly frequently? And I, I try to have a look at the, at the literature because of my own anecdotal experience as well. And, and when, you, when you look in the literature, it's typically around 5 to 10% of all the cases that are seen at some of the units. And, and this is just my own personal experience. So these are all the diving cases that I've personally managed from 4th of March 2019 till 31 October 2021, and, um, and obviously there's a, a bit of a, a, a lockdown somewhere in between there, and I've managed 182 diving-related cases, uh, 334 telephonic calls and all of them with, with emails and things associated with it as well, but 14 of those cases were cutis marmorata. And, and, and that's the proportion of 7.7%. So, so one in 10, one in 20 cases that, uh, that we manage, it's something that is, that is actually more common than, than one would think. So I just want to run through some of these cases. And I think the first case is one that Lawrence would, uh, would also recognize because he was also involved in the, um, in the case. Uh, and this happened with a person that was on a diving holiday in Zanzibar. And, uh, and, and the, the, the group around this table obviously know uh, the, where Zanzibar is. Uh, this patient was diving with uh, the Scooby-Doo um, set up there. And, and whenever I take these calls and, and I present a PowerPoint, I always go and look and see what the divers are doing while I'm sitting in the office. And, 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 um, and I must say, um, they, they are more often, often uh, uh, in, 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 in the better place, even though they've got decompression sickness sometimes. Um, so, but the history of this case, this is a, a young 33-year-old female. She was healthy, and she did uh, the following dive, so 12 meters for 45 minutes on the previous day. And on the day of the dive, she did an 18-meter dive for 45 minutes and then had a surface interval time of 80 minutes and then a second dive, 16 minutes, 45 minutes. After she surfaced, she had this itching and, and skin rash. Uh, she also described a left-sided migraine, which is a very important sign. I'll come back to that again and tingling on the left side of her face and her left hand. She, she says that there's no weakness, it's just this, this uh, tingling sensation. There was a doctor with him on the trip as well, who was a gynae, um, um, and the gynae attempted an, a, a, a diagnosis of this rash and said that it seems like an allergic rash. 
and they gave her antihistamines, but there was no response to this. Um, she was very tired, uh, nauseous, and she said she had a typical migraine, which she didn't have in the past six years, and now suddenly associated with a skin rash, etc. She had this typical migraine that she used to have. And um, being on the trip with the doctor, the gynae there, they monitored her through the night. Um, uh, they report that there were no objective neurological signs. It was just these um, subjective signs of tingling um, that, uh, that she felt uh, on the uh, left side of her face and her left hand. So now she phones me. So this is now uh, a few days after the fact. She phoned the hotline and she says this is now day three of a 10-day diving holiday. And can she continue diving or am I going to mess up a diving holiday? And she wants to know whether this is skin decompression sickness. And this is the photo that she sent. So again, you can see the typical uh, distribution, uh, the marbling of the skin. Um, if you look very closely, I don't know how well it projects, but you can see that there's some purple and then the pinkish. Uh, so definitely two colors around there. And the typical morphology of, um, of cutis marmorata. Now, the question, of course, when we investigate these cases, um, obviously, the question is then answered regarding the diving holiday. And, 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 and sad to say, I had to, uh, to, to cancel the rest of the diving holiday for her, at, at least the diving part of it. But the question now is, how do we do the further investigations to see whether she can dive again? Is she fit to dive? So is this a deserved hit? or is this something that requires further investigations? So if you look at the two dives that she's done on the day of the incident, uh, the first dive 18 meters, 45 minutes, the second dive 16 meters, 45 minutes. So you can see that we use the 18.2 meters depth, 45 minutes, 45 minutes. So both dives actually are well within the no deco limits, as you can see there. And this is how she reported this, this that she did not exceed the no decompression limits and so forth during the dive. However, um, if you've uh, studied diving medicine, you would know you don't look at the dives just in isolation like this uh, because she had a surface interval time of 80 minutes. So when we then say between the two dives, after, after this dive, the first dive, she would obviously exit the water as a group letter H, and then with an 18-minute surface interval time, she would actually start the second dive as a group F diver. And this means that she's got a 36-minute penalty, the residual nitrogen time. And if you look at that, that would make the equivalent single dive time 81 minutes. And if you then say you dive at 18.2 meters depth in, on the table for the 16 meter dive uh, and you use 81 minutes, so that puts you on the 100 minutes, it means that she's got about 14 minutes of omitted decompression during this dive. So when we look at cutis marmorata, uh, of course, when you look at the literature, there's a, a, a huge association with patent foramen ovale or persistent foramen ovale. And the, the evidence seems to suggest that you've got these bubbles or the theories around this is that you've got the bubbles uh, when you've got a, a high venous gas load that these bubbles can then overpower the lung filter, bypass the lung filter, or through a patent foramen ovale, and then embolize the skin, which can then cause the uh, the, the typical presentation. And um, and and we see this then with a, in the context of a very high gas load. So when you have these bubbles then transporting transported via the arterial system you now have the bubbles growing in an area where there's already a high gas load. And this is then typically referred to as the type three decompression sickness. But again, I, I just quote two studies for you there just to show the association with patent foramina vale when you have cutis marmorata um, in, the, in the clinical presentation. So looking at this case, our expectations would then be that there would be significant bubble grades. If you do these dives and you've got 14 minutes of omitted decompression, 
the, the, the evidence would suggest that you would have high bubble grades and therefore with a possible ref, la, right to left shunt, um, there, there is this risk of developing cutis marmorata and she is now known to be a migraine sufferer as well. And we know that there's also an association between migraine and aura with the patent foramen ovale. And you can see the, um, the, 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 the literature reference that I, I, I include in the slide. Now, when you look at the, the systematic review and the meta-analysis, what they say is that migraine with aura is the referred standard for clinical selection of patients for PFO closure. And as you know, the latest evidence not only suggests protection on the diving, uh, from the diving point of view, but also prevention of cryptogenic strokes in patients later in life. So, uh, so it's not just protection from the, from the diving point of view. So uh, uh, Lawrence actually saw this patient um, uh, upon referral, and, and we then decided that we need to send this person for a PFO test. Um, and she was sent to a cardiologist, but the report then came back that there's absolutely no evidence of a patent for amino vale, ASD, VSD, PDA, or anything else. Um, and, uh, and essentially a normal echocardiogram. Now, at this point, uh, this, this didn't make sense to us. And, and Charles is going to speak uh, to this very issue in the next talk. And that is that it is actually very, very difficult to diagnose a patent for amino ovale if you don't do the correct procedures and, and techniques during the echocardiogram. And, and, and that cardiologists also need to be highly experienced to be able to do the test for a PFO. And as diving doctors, we should know that there's a risk of false negative tests but Charles is going to speak to the technique, how it is done, et cetera. And that was published now in March this year. Um, and, uh, and, and he will talk more to that aspect. So I just introduce it at, at this point in time. So the diver then came to us and Cecilia and myself performed the, uh, the, the PFO test. So that we did the carotid Doppler and you can see all the equipment and things um, on, the, on the table as we set it out there. And she had a spontaneous shunt. Uh, of the bubbles when we did the test with the the uh, the uh, bubble contrast that we uh, that we had so so uh, evidence then of a a patent for amino vale and uh, and then we subsequently managed these things so when we then look at skin decompression sickness and you look at the pathophysiology this is one of the theories of the development of skin decompression sickness is that you've got shunted bubbles that would embolize the skin vessels um, and 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 the problem with this theory is that it, it's very difficult to show that you've actually got bubbles in the skin and this is this has not been shown um, uh, uh, at, at the time of, of, of all these theories and you would see a number of publications that come with different theories as well so to say that this is nothing to do with bubbles in the skin because we never see bubbles in the skin it's actually bubbles that embolize the brainstem and then you actually have a disturbance of the control of your skin blood flow. Others say that it is autochthonous bubbles that are forming in the skin and uh, Ran Ariely also uh, published an article looking at lamellar uh, bodies of phospholipids that causes a hydrophobic layer in the skin and this is an area where you can have bubble seeds and then if you've got a high gas load you can actually have the formation of bubbles in the skin by means of this mechanism and these are the main theories that you will see around uh, skin decompression sickness uh, here you can see the brainstem bubble theories so um, uh, when you read the, 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 the heading of the article, it, it seems like this is not a theory anymore, but just see that it's published in medical hypotheses, et cetera, novel hypotheses. So cutis marmorata, skin decompression sickness is a manifestation of brainstem bubble embolization, not of local skin bubbles. Um, and it may be cerebral mediated and all hypothesis on the etiology. So both of these were published in 2015 uh, by, by independent um, uh, researchers. Um, 
So, so that is the, the background and the theory. Let me just show you another case that we dealt with. So this is one of the cases I dealt with recently, one of the uh, also beautiful cases. And you can see again the marbling of the skin, uh, more than one color, the bluish uh, color up there, red and pink around the other areas. And you can see again the trunk, lower back, and the, the uh, triceps area for this, uh, for this patient. Now, uh, when I attended the EUBS conference in, in Tel Aviv in 2019, uh, we actually had the first evidence now that cutis marmorata actually is a result of bubble embolization of the skin. And Eduardo Garcia did a wonderful presentation uh, working in Cozumel in Mexico. And, um, and they actually, whenever they see the cases of cutis marmorata coming in, they actually perform uh, echo uh, on the uh, on on the individuals. And and let me just show you how uh, how this is done. So this is courtesy of Eduardo, the uh, the video over here. So let me just see whether I can play this for you quickly. And uh, you can see in the superficial vessels of the skin, uh, and and even in the deep uh, vessels. You can see the bubbles traveling through the uh, the, uh, the the skin vessels. So, can you all see the, the the bubbles traveling there? And when you look at where this is measured, this is measured on the cutis marmorata skin rash of the patient. So that is where we see the bubbles. And when you look at the rest of the skin, the normal skin, no bubbles whatsoever. So the bubbles are. Uh, physically located in the area of the cutis marmorata. This is just uh, another patient. He actually presented four cases. I just included two of the videos here, uh, just to show you that um, that we can have it in uh, in the in the different uh, areas of the skin. So again, in this area over here, you would see some of the uh, the bubbles that are moving. And uh, in here, you can see some of the bubbles passing through. And again, this is now on the trunk of a patient. And again, limited to the cutis marmorata skin rash area. Right. Can you see the bubbles passing through there? So, uh, so. When you read this this journal article, because they obviously published their findings um, since since doing that uh, that presentation in the at the, at the conference, um, uh, they again say cutis marmorata is a frequent clinical presentation. As I say, uh, between five and ten percent of all the cases that we see uh, and managed via the hotlines are related to cutis marmorata. And what you can see here is that in all cases, numerous small bubbles were seen moving within the skin microvasculature, and no bubbles were seen in the adjacent areas of normal skin. And uh, the four cases that they present here, all four of those divers had a large right to left shunt. Um, and and uh, therefore the association with patent foramen ovale, um, and and it's it's really a, a, a very nice article and, and case studies to read for something that we see fairly frequently. You can see that the dives that the people have done uh, were were quite significant. So uh, so this is just the four divers that they describe: 24 meters, 70 minutes. 50 minutes surface interval, 18 meters, 78 minutes. So you can see, but just note the association with cutis marmorata very often associated with neurological symptoms as well. So spinal DCS, yeah, decreased strength in both legs, tingling and paresthesias, cerebral DCS with confusion and incoherence uh, and some constitutional symptoms, and also vestibular decompression sickness, so inner ear decompression sickness. So, uh, so that's just something to be aware of that, that you don't always just get the skin uh, in isolation being affected. So the pathophysiology, the, the two main theories that, uh, that seems to be the, the, the explainer of cutis marmorata is the arterialization of the venous bubbles associated with the right to left shunt and then growth of these bubbles as they enter the saturated tissues. 
You can also, of course, have local formation of bubbles in the skin or skin blood vessels, as uh, is hypothesized by Ariely with the um, hydrophobic surfaces that, uh, that one may have there. But again, just note the common involvement of the neurological system. So all cases should be evaluated for neurological involvement. Typically, it would be spinal, cerebral, and, uh, and inner ear uh, abnormalities that we see. So let's come to the management. How do we manage skin decompression sickness? Uh, obviously, if you have a diver with neurological decompression sickness, uh, they would receive decompression therapy and so forth. Um, but if you look at the consensus guideline regarding the pre-hospital management of decompression sickness, um, Simon Mitchell and, and colleagues reviewed uh, these, uh, these, uh, uh, the, the treatment options, and this is basically the principles. So in terms of procedural considerations, we know that all divers, when you go diving, you must have contact details and a rapid, reliable means of communication to a medical practitioner and emergency services. And if you have these symptoms, it must be discussed with a diving medical physician as soon as possible. The first aid treatment, we obviously give 100% oxygen, so surface oxygen therapy. And we must give it as soon as possible after the person has onset of symptoms. And obviously, divers should be trained to be able to do this in the field and have oxygen first aid kits available. The system that we use must be able to give a high percentage of oxygen. So you don't want to use a Venturi mask for something like that. So, uh, so the, the oxygen supplies that we want to see at a dive site would be the appropriate equipment, but also to make sure that you've got sufficient um, size of cylinders, etc., so that you can cover the duration of the evacuation scenario. We want the person to be on oxygen the whole time that they've been evacuated. In terms of positioning of the patient, um, the horizontal position uh, is, the, uh, is the preferred method, so not head down, not Trendelenburg or anything like that. So the horizontal position is the, uh, is the consensus statement. Obviously, we give oral rehydration if the person is conscious. If they're not fully conscious, then, uh, then obviously we won't do that. But uh, the fluid should be non-carbonated, non-caffeinated, non-alcoholic, and ideally isotonic. If you've got a suitable qualified provider, then we want to start IV fluids and we can give non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. The other agents, as you can see there, doesn't have any sufficient evidence and divers should be kept thermally, com thermally uh, comfortable, uh, warm, but not hyperthermic, obviously. And then when you look at the triage and telemedicine, the goals would be to evaluate the likelihood of reported symptoms, whether this is decompression sickness or whether it's something else, and to advise the patient on the, uh, on the management. And here you can see the, the guidelines for, uh, for, 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 for the treatment of, of mild DCS. So when we look at mild DCS, the question here is whether recompression therapy is necessary or not. And you can see included in this would be a skin rash. So mild symptoms include the skin rash where these manifestations are static or emitting and significant neurological dysfunction has been excluded to the satisfaction of the diving physician. And I think that's an important aspect is you don't need to give recompression therapy for cutis marmorata cases if there's no neurological involvement. Um, and the question, of course, is how you do this. So you can see they say to the satisfaction of the diving physician, and this is actually a very significant shift from the initial discussion when we talked about um, remote treatment of decompression sickness or the treatment of decompression sickness in remote locations. Previously, we said that you cannot designate something as mild unless a doctor has examined the patient and excluded neurological um, involvement. Now, we say that you don't need that. It must just be to the satisfaction of the diving physician. And you can see the comments over here. I just want to come to this as they say that exclusion is most reliably achieved by a neurological examination performed by a doctor, but such examination may not be available if the person is in a remote uh, environment. And therefore, they say it can be appropriate for a diving medical physician to manage a case as mild in the absence of an, a proper neurological examination if you uh, engage the person appropriately and make sure that there are no major signs. 
Recompression therapy is the gold standard, but these signs and symptoms, they may be managed without recompression therapy. So a diver that is diagnosed uh, with decompression sickness must be managed in accordance with that guideline. So 2A to I that I had previously, so 100% oxygen, oral fluids, IV fluids as appropriate, give non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. The others doesn't have a lot of evidence uh, in uh, transporting them in the horizontal position. Those are the type of things that are mentioned in there. And they should be monitored regularly during the first 24 hours to, to make sure that there are no new symptoms that develop. And if you have these mild symptoms and you then have a delay to recompression, this is unlikely to have any major long-term uh, adverse outcome in, for these patients. So let me give you an example of such a case. So this was actually um, the second case on the same day at the same location. The first uh, guy phoned and he said he had a skin rash and he was breathing oxygen, but it, uh, it was uh, actually just chafing from the, from the wetsuit. So I said, no, this is not a problem, you know, so, so it's not decompression sickness. You don't have to worry about it. And then he said, uh, but my buddy also had a rash. Do you mind looking at him? And I said, yes, yeah, send me the photos. <laughs> and it was a clear cutis marmorata case. So again, you can see the development here, so bluish and pinkish around the trunk and, 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 and that area. Um, you can actually see it on both sides sides, the, uh, the, the skin rash over there. We gave this person one hour of surface oxygen therapy and everything was gone, back to 100% normal within one hour. So, uh, so this is a very typical presentation that, that, that I've seen with, with, with some of these cases. So, so obviously, if there's no neurological involvement, it's just the skin rash, we give the person the 100% oxygen therapy and the treatment that we've said uh, that we do typically for mild decompression sickness. And these cases don't then have to go to a recompression chamber to, uh, to get treatment. In terms of just an update on the patent for Amen Avale Association and, and the closure thereof, there is a joint position statement on PFO and diving that was issued by SPUMS and the UK SDMC. And, uh, and you can see uh, Mark Turner, our cardio, uh, cardiologist consultant of SUMA, was part of that, uh, of that team, and we all know the, the, the other people involved as well. So firstly, routine screening for PFO at the time of a dive medical assist, uh, assessment is not indicated. So we don't screen for PFOs in all divers as a routine. Um, we do it when there is an indication. So the consideration is the following. So if you have a history of decompression sickness with cerebral, spinal, vestibular, cochlear, and cutaneous manifestation. So this is the typical presentation. Cutis marmorata with neurological involvement. This is highly associated with the PFO. And if you look at the literature, um, it is around 78% of cases have a PFO that is, that is demonstrated. Obviously, uh, the other indications there as well. So history, past history of migraine with aura, uh, cryptogenic stroke, and then uh, history of PFO ASD in a first degree relative. And you can see the levels of evidence is actually fairly high, level 2A. Uh, so, so it is, it is, it's, um, it is uh, this indication that, that I very often use for PFO screening in divers. If the screening is performed, then it must be undertaken at centers well practiced in the technique. And, uh, and I'll, uh, Charles will obviously speak to that in the next talk. The screening must include a bubble contrast, ideally combined with TTE because of the best facilit uh, this, this facilitates cooperation with provocative maneuvers. And, uh, and, and, and the screening must include the use of the provocative maneuvers like uh, Valsalva or sniffing. So we use Valsalva in, in our unit uh, when we do the, uh, the, the carotid dopplers. Interpretation of a PFO test. Uh, so if you've got a spontaneous shunt without provocation or you've got a large provoked shunt, uh, then um, uh, those risk factors uh, uh, for those form of DCI is listed in statement two. So, so people with uh, cutis marmorata neurological involvement, that is the risk factor, this, this large PFO. Smaller shunts um, with the lower but poorly defined risk of DCI and, and therefore those ones um, uh, are more difficult to, to manage. If you have a diver with a diagnosis of a PFO, 
then there are a number of options. Obviously, some people can decide to stop diving, uh, but that's a low level four uh, consensus evidence. So this is, is typically not what we would advise people. So we advise them to close the PFO, which you can see is the final point there, or if they don't want to close the PFO, they can just dive more conservatively. Remember that a PFO is only a problem if there are bubbles to shunt. So if you do the type of dives where there's no shunting or no bubbles that can shunt, then the person can continue diving. So some examples of how you can change your diving practice is you can reduce your dive times, uh, stay well within the no deco limits, restrict your dive depths to less than 15 meters, only one dive a day, use nitrox while you dive on air tables, and so on and so forth. So you can see a number of ways in which you can dive safely, even if you have a PFO. And then obviously, when we look at the options of whether you stop diving, whether you close the PFO, or whether you just change your diving practices, they need careful consideration of the risks and benefits and, the, and, and what is the clinical setting in which the person did the testing. So did they have decompression sickness before or what was the, uh, the typical presentation? Following a closure, so if a person did close the PFO, uh, there's actually a large number of them that still continue to shunt, that you don't get a full closure. So they must have a follow-up test, uh, a minimum of three months after the closure to, to confirm that the, the PFO was in fact closed. And then diving should not be resumed under this PFO closure is confirmed and uh, the diver has seized the potent antiplatelet medication. You can obviously continue diving if you're just on aspirin, but some of the others that are associated with the procedure, you need to, to obviously stop taking. And then uh, in terms of the, the most common procedure used, we've had numerous presentations on SOMA conferences regarding the Amplatzer device. Um, that's the one that is most commonly used. And I'm not going to talk too much into, into too much detail with this again, but uh, well described and, uh, and the, the, the effect uh, that this has on the recurrence of neurological decompression illness in divers. And that's the quick overview of skin decompression sickness, the pathophysiology, how we treat it, and how do we examine patients afterwards to see whether they are fit to dive. Are there any questions? Thank you very much, Jack, for a fantastic and informative lecture and also giving us an update on the management of, of that um, skin decompression sickness. Any yes. questions? Yeah, so uh, so which tables do we use to, to treat the person if they've got decompression sickness? So are you talking about uh, with neurological involvement? So a person with vestibular symptoms and so forth. So there are a number of, of uh, publications on this issue uh, comparing, for instance, the long oxygen table with the COMEX-30 table. And, uh, and it, it showed no difference between the two. Now, of course, one needs to interpret that with caution because of the numbers that are involved. This is not something that, uh, that one would randomize um, uh, very easily. So in the end, it, it typically ends up being the preference of the person involved in the treatment. My personal approach is that there are significant risks if you go deeper than, uh, than, than 18 meters if there are complications in the chamber. So if you have a patient that has got uh, central neurological involvement, not necessarily just inner ear, but this is a person that has got um, uh, uh, lower uh, decreased levels of consciousness and so forth, then it's very difficult to manage such a complicated case when you are very deep. To me, the, the comparison comes between COMEX-30 and the long auction table in, in what are you actually trying to achieve with the treatment. With the COMEX-30 table, you go to a, a depth of 30 meters, four atmospheres absolute, which means that you're going for depth and therefore you're trying to compress bubbles and reduce bubble volume. So that's something that one would use if you think that I'm still treating bubbles. But remember, when you do the COMEX-30 treatment table, you are using a gas mix that is 50-50 heliox or nitrox. So at four atmospheres, you're giving an oxygen partial pressure of two atmospheres absolute. 
Well, if you use a long auction table at 18 meters, you don't give two atmospheres absolute, you give 2.8 atmospheres absolute. So your oxygen partial pressure is much higher with a long auction table than with the COMEX 30 table. So if you think that I'm treating hypoxia and distal hypoxia as a result of bubbles, or I'm treating the secondary effects of bubbles, then the long auction table would be superior in terms of the theoretical decisions that one would make. Uh, so these are the ways in which I, I typically take the, the, the decision. Um, but I typically would start with the long auction table. If a patient is stable or he improves at 18 meters, then I just continue with the table and complete the long auction table with or without extensions as appropriate. But if I have a patient that I've got at 18 meters and within that first 20 minutes he starts deteriorating, in other words, it gets worse, then I would say, let's go deeper. And that would typically be a guy that comes out of the water very fresh. He comes to the chamber very quickly. I'm concerned about treating of bubbles. And then I would say, okay, let's use the COMEX 30 table for that. But obviously you need to have the gas and the equipment and all those sort of things uh, available to be able to, to give that treatment. But the literature shows no difference between the, the the two tables. Yes, so you, you, you can start with a long auction table and then move over to the COMEX 30 and there are specific procedures in which you move from the one table to the next. Yeah. Cool. Any, any other questions? Um, maybe not a question comment. They say that five to ten of patients with, a, um, with cutaneous manifestations of DCS. It's just a perception on my part. Uh, I, I see quite a number of dive instructors and some of the technical divers as well, who basically regard skin decompression sickness as, as a minor thing and fairly common. Uh, well, the guys I spoke to, a, a much higher percentage of them um, mentioned this as as common things that they see, they don't even call anyone. They treat themselves with the yeah. with some oxygen, surface oxygen. So it might be higher. And then the other thing is that lady, did she also send the um, dive profiles through? To because uh, just an, uh, it seems fairly benign dives at 18 and, and 14 meters. And if it's just a, a maximum depth, that I mean, that's I know that's how do the tables. But if it's just a maximum depth and she spent most of the time at eight meters, it, it might have been. Who completely yes. undeserved it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so uh, I I agree that that it might be more common than and and obviously the the the, the divers that that you involved with you know doing more technical and deeper dives sometimes um, they are more prone to develop these things um, as the, the bubble grades increase with depth and time that you that you that you spend at that depth. Um, but uh, but I agree. But divers divers don't take this seriously enough, um, and and there is a high association with neurological involvement that one should just screen for. But I actually do see a large proportion of them with no neurological involvement, and then with normal surface oxygen therapy, it it, it just resolves. The question, of course, is do you want to take that chance if you develop this syndrome? Do you want to take that chance and continue doing deep technical dives and have a PFO which you can shunt and have serious neurological consequences? So I would always advise the people, it's fine if you treat the mild case, but we still need to consider the dive profile, etc., and whether there's a need for a PFO test just to exclude the risk on subsequent dives. Okay, so the question is, what is the need for the, 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 the short auction table when you've got mild decompression sickness? So, uh, so the, the, the consensus, um, and, and this is all around the world, so this is the consensus statement of how do we treat mild decompression sickness. And the consensus is that you actually need no recompression therapy whatsoever if it's truly mild decompression sickness. You can treat it with oxygen, fluids, NSAIDs and, and, and all of the other things that we've mentioned. But if you have a chamber available, then obviously your resolution of those symptoms um, would be much quicker. Um, most practitioners would also say, you know, my own medical legal risk of, of, of the managing of the case 
is, is much lower. If I've got a chamber available, just put the patient in the chamber and get it over and done with. So many people will then say, okay, actually, I don't need to give any recompression therapy whatsoever, but to be safe, I will put the patient in the chamber and then there's one of two choices. So then they will use the short oxygen table, the US Navy treatment table five, or some would just give a normal US Navy treatment table nine, the normal HBO table, 90 minutes, 14 or 15 meters depth and bring the patient out. But in terms of the, the, the requirement for recompression therapy, that's not there unless there's neurological involvement, in which case the short oxygen table has got no place whatsoever. You have to go to a minimum of the long oxygen table and proper treatment for, for decompression sickness. So, so um, can you just clarify, uh, just switch on your, your microphone so that the, so the question is after the person recovered from cutis marmorata with the long oxygen table. So, so I'm assuming that the person then had neurological decompression sickness as well. So then there are a number of guidelines. So the DMAC guideline actually say that if you have um, uh, such a presentation, then you need to be out of the water uh, for a period of uh, between one and three months. I can't remember the exact time, but there's a, there's a specific guideline for commercial divers. But obviously, if you have a PFO, it would be much longer because the person would obviously have to go for the PFO repair. And then you wait a minimum of three months before you... So it depends on, so how long the person stays in a medical facility is dependent on the clinical presentation of the patient and, and how stable he is. So if he's unstable, you would admit him to hospital. If he's highly unstable and it's got major neurological involvement, you will admit him to an ICU. And if he's totally symptom free, then you would discharge him and manage him on an outpatient basis. Any other questions? No questions? No further questions? Thank you very much.